welcome to Dragons, Gazelles, and Unicorns podcast and webinar. I'm Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation at Ignite Social Impact. I'm here to welcome, a uh, very warm welcome to Nick D'Onofrio, um, a prodigy. Uh, if you were to ask anyone about the first chips uh, for our computers, he's the one who made them. <laughs> and. Uh, He's a pro prolific technologist and also an entrepreneur in many, many ways and uh, kind of an innovation superstar, uh, leading growth globally for IBM for more than 45 years, I think, um, on the podcast. On a number, he's on a number of boards as well, uh, objectors, and I'm uh, very privileged to have him as the chairman of my board, but he's the board of uh, many large companies, um, which he can chat about more, but um, like Liberty Mutual, Mellon Bank of New York, uh, MITRE, uh, and um, engineering organizations as well that, that are um, prolific as well. And also welcoming um, Michael DeMarco. He's the founder and CEO of American Journeys since 2004. So I feel very privileged to have them on this webinar and uh, podcast. And um, again, my name is Rosemary Truman, founder and CEO of the Center for Advancing Innovation. But uh, I feel, again, very privileged to and honored to have these two gentlemen to speak, be speaking today. And so I'm just going to pause there and um, maybe uh, Nick and uh, and Michael, you could do an introduction, a better introduction than I did <laughs> uh, about yourselves. Sure. So Rosemary, no, it's not better, uh, maybe just a little different perspective for people. Uh, I am Nick D'Onofrio. I live here in Ridgefield, Connecticut, born and raised in New York, uh, not so far from here on the Hudson River in a little city called Beacon, New York. I'm actually a second generation American. My grandparents were all um, born, raised, and emigrated from Southern Italy. Um, one of four children from a very poor family, but you know, in Italian households, as long as you had food to eat, you were never poor. So we never thought of ourselves that way. Um, so my my perspective is a little different than most people's, given the way I grew up. Uh, I am an electrical engineer. I, honor, I did honest work for a living at one time, as Rosemary alluded to. Um, I actually did design chips and computers, and, and I did some pretty fun stuff um, before I either corrupted or co-opted myself and became a manager or a leader and stopped doing that stuff and just directed that stuff. And that's where I got my passion for innovation, understanding it better and trying to figure out how to enable it in a broader sense. That innovation a dream of mine is kind of alive in my book. If nothing changes, nothing changes. And that innovation thought process all centers around having the widest, broadest, deepest, open, collaborative, multidisciplined, broad-based thinking group enabled to all focus on the same problem. More later. Thanks for having me, Rosemary. Uh, well, Nick is very humble. He um, um, has done um, volumes more than he mentioned. Um, <clears throat> And uh, and I can't wait to delve into if nothing changes, nothing changes. And I, I you know, what reverberates in my mind are all the times we were together, uh, sitting next to each other and talking about these quotes that that uh, really are amazing. If nothing changes, nothing changes. Uh, connecting talent with opportunity and so on. So. Uh, I even uh, dream about that stuff. So thank you, Nick, so much for, for uh, yeah, for uh, my pleasure. So yeah. you know, in all truth, full truth in advertising, Rosemary know and I know each other for a long time. We worked together at IBM. We fixed a lot of the 
miserable problems that existed in IBM in the late 80s, early 90s. And we were responsible for building a different, a new and different development and research process, an investment process uh, okay. for the IBM company. So that's how we first became uh, aware of each other. And we were in dire straits and, and she and the organization she represented came in to help us. And I'll never forget that. And I'll never forgive her for that. You'll never forgive me for it. Yeah, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I, of course, I'm going to only never forget. You oh. did a great job. You did a great job. Thank you so much. I mean, what, what, how many times did we do it? Like, hmm. Well, there was a lot of them. We ended up, because we succeeded so well with that process, we went on and did a whole bunch of others for yeah. IBM as well. Yeah, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm uh, fortunate to have been, it was fortuitous to have had the opportunity to work with you at the beginning of these transformations. Remember when IBM was on the front page of the Times Magazine with all the little dinosaurs? Um, remember it painfully well, yeah. Remember when you and I were sitting together and we're talking about like the spreadsheets and I was sitting there and I was just saying, like this person's going to purgatory, this person. <laughs> we have the Dante circles and so on and so forth. Um, but there's a very large, climbing range that you had to get to where you were uh, and where you are. And um, I think that everybody would love to learn about how did you get to where you are? Because I remember talking to you about, I mean, as, as you already discussed, the chip, I mean, you made the pretty much, if I, if I know properly, because I I did research on this and, and, and of course you have transformed other chip companies as well, but like, what was your trajectory, you know? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so uh, I guess I should, should uh, kind of preface this with being an engineer, you become a problem solver. And that's kind of the way I made my way at IBM, was hopefully solving problems and not creating them. And I, I realized that early on, Rosemary, when I stopped doing honest work for a living, and then started becoming a manager, a leader, that I had to change. Um, so my, my trajectory was, it was almost like a, a straight up in the early years. When you're technical, you're either good or you're not. You either uh, you know, are recognized for the work you do, you're doing or you do, you, you're not recognized and you fall by the wayside. I mean, I joined IBM at a time when I had to actually qualify myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I was only given 18 months to certify myself mm -hmm. as a full member of IBM. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a different world because everything was changing so fast and so rapidly at that time. But the big switch was when I became that manager and realized that it was no longer me doing anything. It was me enabling mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. And I prefer, I prefer that word enablement. I learned quickly um, how to listen better. I learned quickly how to understand what people were trying to do and ask them literally every time we met. So what more do you need to get the job done? Do you have everything you need? Uh, don't forget when you're in trouble to come back to me and let's talk about the problems and the issues because when you grow up in a, in a research and development environment, there's always trouble. Nothing goes in a straight line. Mm -hmm. there's, there's always somebody trying to trying to um, either cram something in that shouldn't be there or cut an edge that shouldn't have been cut or forget to test it this way or forget to you know inspect it that way. So the more experience you have, you start to realize that not only are you the enabler, but you have to build an environment where people feel compelled to be forthright, tell you the truth, so mm. that you could you can be forthcoming to help them. So it, that worked. I mean, I, I got it all screwed up in the beginning in my first management job, but that those are the lessons I learned in that first job in Burlington, Vermont. And then from there, the path forward became much clearer for me. 
Mm. Be the enabler, build that trusting environment, listen as well as you speak, if not better, and be there to be the forthcoming person when people are willing to admit there's a problem. Risks are all over the place, I've learned, and I keep reminding people, you can't always manage those risks alone. Mm -hmm. That's why I think my career took off the way it took off in IBM and outside of IBM, as you alluded to. I mean, I went, I was a member of the board at AMD when we re rebooted that company into what it is today. I mean, I was responsible for bringing Lisa Sue to AMD and Mark Papermaster to AMD. These were colleagues of mine at IBM. Uh, former colleagues of mine at IBM. Um, and we did a terrific job of rebasing that whole company or Delphi Automotive, which is now active. So, you know, fortunate, Rosemary, being an yeah. engineer, being an engineer and, and focusing on problems, which is what engineers do, kind of led my way for me. Mm. Um. So, um, you know, one of my, I guess a couple of my degrees are in engineering, but I th you have uh, excelled much, uh, exceeded excelling at, at being an engineer, I believe, in my opinion. And um, the, the things that, that always ring in my ears when, when you talk is, uh, when you're in trouble, talk about the issues, solving problems, you know, looking at the big picture and then also identifying the problems, I would say, because the uh, thing is that sometimes people don't see the problems. And uh, I think that that is an enormous skill. The other thing that you mentioned was you cram something in somewhere and then you, cut something else that should be not cut perhaps. So the, I'll, I'll take them one by one. I took down five questions that I have, but you know, I, so I have a funny story. Um, recently I had someone say, oh, well, how do you create an implementation that I can have dark screen mode for a very an ERP system, right? So they want the cloud computing platform, and I thought that was fascinating because why do you need that? But the it's like the, the 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 point you mentioned about cramming something in that how does it benefit and everyone? Um, and you no, know, so uh, I'm trying to prioritize my points. Let me let me maybe start with the first one. How do you, how did you ever learn how to listen better? Yeah, I think you learn how to listen better when you realize that you're a terrible listener and <laughs> you, you get feedback from people that simply say, you're bad at this. You really okay. don't know what you're doing. I mean, that happened to me very early in my career at IBM. My first management job in, in old IBM, Opinion surveys, morale surveys, were everything for managers. Um, if you didn't, if you didn't do well in them, you stand a good chance to lose your job. Um, um, now, in old IBM, that could have meant just don't let me ever see you again. You know, go <laughs> do something else uh, as opposed to really lose your job. So I got a terrible, terrible, terrible first opinion survey when um, I moved my team to Burlington, Vermont. I mean, it said to me. They were my friends, by the way. I used to work in that group, uh, which is always a, dyno, a dynamite situation. I knew the job better than they do. I knew exactly what they should have been doing. I probably should, you know, I could have been doing what they were doing, but none of that mattered because I was doing it all the wrong way. I wasn't listening. I was telling, hmm. you know, and and uh, I, I almost lost my job. I mean, I had a horrible opinion survey. What is terrible? I had a 1.1. A 1.1. So you can't, somebody actually was worse than me and thank God because they got rid of them and decided to hold on to me. Um, but I learned from that. It was like, Nick, stop thinking you're doing this stuff. 
start listening to us asking for help to get yeah. it done. So that, that, and you know this from your consulting work, that's like a near-death experience and you don't want to make a steady living, you know, having near-death experiences. <laughs> but it, it helped me clearly understand how bad I was. So if you're going to be bad, uh, you better make sure somebody tells you you're bad and you better do it as soon as you can. Oh, that's that's a very good point. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. I, I have to reflect on that, actually. Um, <clears throat> but I agree with you. It, it's a gift to get some feedback that will allow you to progress, but I can't believe anyone would ever see your bad. But listen, okay. I mean, when you're in the room, you're like the one who calls. It's all an, it's all an acquired skill, my friend. <laughs> uh, that, those are lessons learned. It wasn't that way in the beginning. Uh, uh, Hard for you to understand that, maybe, but it's true. Oh, come on. Did you know, did, don't you think I learned that ever, like, all the time I was at IBM? When, but um, Cody, Cody can get that part out. Yeah. <laughs> it was a... Uh, Keep fun. reading. Keep reading that book, Rosemary. You know, it's yeah. all in there. I will. Um, so, um, so you you mentioned when you're in trouble, talk about the issues. So, uh, so let's say there's somebody who's just in dire straits, and um, when nothing changes, nothing changes, right? So, how do you bring up the issues in a way that people can be approached? Yeah. So I think the more uh, the more sincere you are, the more transparent and open you are, uh, the more the more candid you are about. I understand. I was there. I've made those mistakes. I've had those problems. Mm -hmm. You know. You know. Don't fool. Don't don't let somebody think that they can fool you when they can't. And the worst thing in the world is to let someone think they have fooled you. When they haven't, tell them, you know, tell them, I don't believe you. It doesn't make any sense. You know, this can't be true. By the way, I mean, we could talk about board practices too, Rosemary. This is part of the reason boards get in trouble is they stop asking questions. They, they only ask the what. They mm. don't ask the why, the where, the how, the when. Because sometimes it's in the how, the why, the where, and the when that the real answer lies. It's not just you got it done, but how did you do that? Why did you do that? And when you start to ask those questions, you're kind of not only enabling a better environment to be collaborative in and to go back and forth in, I'd like to say you're enabling the truth to be told. Mm -hmm. And and I, I I think in a world that we live in, that's, that's worth its weight in rare earth. To be honest with you, if there's something more valuable than gold or platinum, I'll take it. So I think that's the way people have to start to think. Don't don't be so willing to to just end it with, okay, you got it done, good for you. Here's the gold star. It's like, hey, if you cheated, lied, and stole to get it done, I don't want it done that way, and you get no reward for doing it that way. Mm -hmm. So this better behavior that you're looking for, I think that has to be taught that has to become an acquired skill that has to be part of your culture yeah. culture is the operative word here rosemary you have to build a culture of trust and openness where you can't do the job anymore i said that right as a manager as a leader i can't do it mm. but i can enable you to do it and enable you to do it better mm -hmm. and uh <clears throat> not an easy skill enable you to do it better um but critical so but that that's such a transparency thing i i um i think that's you and I, you know i were very transparent with each other <laughs> so uh the thing is that i th i believe in transparency as well um yeah. as my, my team but so one other thing that you, so I, I want to get to your book because I'm really excited about it. 
But one thing that you always say, what, okay, forgive me if I'm um, saying it incorrectly, but what could be known as knowable? Yeah. So, yeah, this is this gets back to that truth point, Rosemary, right? Yeah. So, and not everybody agrees with me, and I confuse a lot of people with this statement, my wife included. Um, and my kids, my kids don't think I should be saying this in public. Um, yeah. But here, go, here it goes. <laughs> the, the point I'm trying to make is, since time began, everything that has ever been known is eventually knowable. It's event, we find out everything eventually. The question is, how long does it take for knowledge to be imparted, for us to acquire knowledge? So I like to say, everything known has always been knowable, and the time to knowledge is shrinking because of technology. And I think you have to live your life that way. Mm. So, you know, lying, cheating, stealing, making stuff up, that doesn't work. We're going to find that out. It's going to catch up with you. I mean, you see, you see what happens to businesses, right? Uh, eventually, all that kind of stuff catches up to you. It, it caught up to IBM. Yes. I'm not saying that people lied, cheated, and stole, but you know they were they were they were foolish yes. about what was going on in the market. They were blind to certain things. So I'm telling you, everything that is known has always been knowable. And the time to knowledge is shrinking because of technology. We're getting smarter faster. And that has nothing to do with AI, by the way. So I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you we're going to work into a world of singularity. Uh, I'm not a sponsor of that or a believer in that. I am telling you, though, that this is what's happening. And this is what you have to worry the most about. Yeah. I remember sitting next to you, Nick, uh, with the spreadsheets. Do you remember that? Of course I do. Yeah. Um, uh, we but look. I mean, most people don't know this, but you know, we took we took almost five billion dollars yes. out of the uh, IBM research and development budget oh, without yeah. skipping a beat. Without skipping a beat. In I fact, if you, go, if you go look at that right now, go look at IBM's research and development budget. It remains at six billion dollars. That's the number we put in. In yeah. 1990, 1990, 1991, 1992. It's the same freaking number. Yeah. And I remember finding $7 billion. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, There's, my gosh. Yeah. And we were also responsible for, what, $6 billion worth of write-offs, too. Like, because when, like when, you, when, when you do that, yeah, when you do that, you know, you end up saying, you know, we got to scrap these ideas, we got to scrap those ideas, we got to scrap those yeah. ideas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, it, it, this, this gets to another point, and maybe you're leading me that way, having the courage yes. of your conviction, right? Mm -hmm. So lots of people can see this stuff, to your point, Rosemary, but then they like, well, whoa, that, are you kidding? I'm not going to tell anybody, not me. Mm -hmm. I'm not telling them we got to take a $6 billion write-off or a $15 billion write-off. I'm not telling them that we've got to, in our case, we had to reduce every other person in the Mid Hudson Valley. We had to, we had to get rid of 30,000 people. I know. 30,000 people. Not 3,000, not 300, 30,000 people. Because of what? Because we made mistakes as leaders. That those were leadership mistakes, those were leadership errors. And I'm not indicting anyone. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But th that's our, when, every, when anybody says they need a layoff, when everybody says they, they need to get rid of people, honestly, and I've only seen this a few times, the leaders could stand up and say, and that's because of our poor judgment. It's nothing you did wrong. You, the people didn't do it wrong. We, the leaders, did it wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's why we don't need you know, 5,000 people that were about to let go or 500 or five people that were let, about ready to let go. No, no courage of their conviction. Bad mm -hmm. sign, bad sign. So to Nick, um, okay, so I, I agree with what you're saying and I understand it immensely, but 
if you were to uh, give some recommendations to the people who are listening in and who will hear this, because it's going to be broadcasted to about uh, 60,000 people. <laughs> so um, how do you encourage people to have courage? So look, um, yeah, that's, that's a hard question. That's a cultural issue, it's a lifestyle issue. Uh, those are things you have to dig deep inside and kind of believe in on your own. I can't give you courage, right? What is it? Courage is, is just, it's that extra little effort, Rosemary. You know, the ability to stay a minute longer, the ability to say a few more words, the mm. ability to think a little clearer, it's not like it's a whole pill that you take the courage pill and everything happens. It's 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 within you already. The mm. question is, are, are you willing? Are, are you willing to just simply, as thoughtfully as you can? I, I'm not a mean spirited individual. I'm not a mean spirited person. No, no, no. I, mean, I I I remember having to tell IBM that we needed to lay off. 30,000 people in the Mid-Hudson Valley, and they were shocked by what I said, shocked. And I said to them, what more do you want of me? If we don't lay off these 30,000, we might as well lay off all 60,000 because we don't stand a chance of getting the job done. The way we're configured, wrong technology, wrong approach. So... You know, where does that come from? It's a really good question. I mean, maybe it's my bringing up, maybe it's my mother and father, maybe it's my religion, maybe it's my culture, my heritage. I don't know. Um, I'd like to believe it was IBM because IBM always encouraged me, you know, to speak up and to speak out and to make it my company. And I think when you start to think that way, Rosemary, when you start to think of it as my company or my enterprise or my business, or my so you talked about uh, entrepreneurship. I, I think the biggest deal in the world is entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. if, if you can turn that entrepreneur traits and characteristics that you have inwardly to a, a massive company such as IBM or others, that entrepreneurship is just as important and probably as valid as anything. And maybe that's flowing in my blood, to your point. Maybe I have that edginess of an entrepreneur. And I used it first as an entrepreneur. Um, so I don't, I, by the way, entrepreneurs have a lot of courage. They have the courage of their conviction. That's why they do what they do. That's why they step out on their own. That's why they risk everything. Uh, because they have a vision. They see it. I, I will tell you this. The opposite is equally true. To have a vision, to, to see the truth and to do nothing about it, Mm. It's, it's a sin. I agree. And more, more people do that. And we can cite example after example of that, Rosemary. Uh, mm. The fact of the matter is, you know it when you see it, and you can see the opposite going on all the time. When people just simply refuse to take the action that is obvious. Mm. Uh, um, sorry, I'm taking notes. Uh, so um, remember, I mean, 30 years ago, when we um, were sitting next to each other doing spreadsheet, I was at a spreadsheet and you have, you're, you're sitting there and, and um, we were uh, talking about the, the obvious, you know, disconnects between the system, what's in the system and what's in the spreadsheet. And um, going back to the entrepreneurship point, um, I don't know if, uh, how do you instill that into someone or does it just, because, because my um, view is that it's, that's difficult to come by, meaning, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it is, it is difficult, but you, you, you build an environment, Rosemary, Mm. Uh, you build an environment, as I said earlier, that is open, collaborative, multidisciplined, broad-based, global in its thinking, that always focuses on the problem. If you start with the problem and not the answer, 
you're always going to enable better results. And if you do it in an open environment, by the way, I mean, none of this is just me whistling here you know, by the graveyard. A lot of this work is available on the Council on Competitiveness's website called the NII. We actually wrote that for them many years ago, and they they spiffed it and, and, and buffed it up a couple of times, Rosemary. So that became our formula at IBM, you know, after Sam took over, you know, and we moved down this innovation path. That was the platform. That was my innovation platform for IBM. You know, it, and, and by the way, you have to be honest with yourself. Like, hey, you could have the best invention in the world. You, you could do the greatest creativity work in the world. But if it doesn't create any value for anyone, then by my definition, it's not an innovation. Yeah. No value, no innovation. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I'm not interested in just running the periodic table every other day. You know, I'm not, in, I'm not interested in, you know, just a whole bunch of bright ideas. What problem are we trying to solve? And, what, and by that value, it could be financial value, it could be political value, economic value, educational, I mean, social. So what value are you creating? What problem did you solve that nobody could ever solve? Right, right. En enable that environment. Yes, yes, yes. And, and you will get entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs all over the place. So um, Nick is very humble. He. Um... He worked with Lou Gerstner and Sam Bosomo. Sam, uh, Sam um, I, I always pronounce his last name. Um, Tom is not. Um, I'm really good at telling you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. And then um, I didn't do this with Nick, but Nick and I both did paper routes. So we. <laughs> I did. We both did paper routes. We chatted about it. Yeah. So, um, I. I delivered a hundred papers a day, six days a week, uh, in the afternoon uh, oh. for five for five years. Oh, geez, I did. But I, I was fortunate though. I, I think I told you this right. I won the Gannett News Carrier Scholarship Yay. in my region. That's how I got to RPI. That's how oh, I got to oh, oh gosh, that's awesome! I, uh, wow, yeah, I only did, um, only did forty-five papers a day. So, well, okay. well not so, bad, not bad. Uh, but it was, it was like basically, you know, uh, it was, it was not easy. But the, the, um, <clears throat> so I, I liked the. I wanted to carry on with the point about um, if you're creating value, no value with with no innovation is not important and so the maybe I, I'm, I'm taking notes as you were talking so I, maybe I, I i hopefully i paraphrased it correctly but the the point is that you're creating value and that with innovation and without innovation you're not really pushing things forward so um if you had a way to explain to people how to create value with innovation um what would you advise and, and yeah. that, by the way it's maybe it's too broad of a question but no no it's not it's, it's actually a really good question and it's pretty straightforward uh again that council on competitiveness uh paper called the nii the national innovation initiative helps you understand this but it's all about doing what we've been saying, Rosemary, starting with the problem, something that's worthwhile. Um, and then you unlock that hidden value that everybody looks at. Everybody sees it, but but can't get to it. You, you unlock that hidden value in a unique and facile way. That's how innovation occurs. So I don't want people confused. I'm not saying that we shouldn't invent. I'm not saying we shouldn't create. We should do all those things. But do what with them becomes right. the question. Mm -hmm. And th th this is this is your life. What do you do with the center? You kind of unlock that hidden value. It's there. If somebody somebody created something, invented something, and doesn't know what to do with it, mm -hmm. and they don't know, they don't know how to create the value that matters. And by the way, not everything that's invented or, or created necessarily is 
capable of creating value. So you have to be honest with yourself there too, you know, in terms of what you're trying to do. So if you do what we've been talking about, and if you, as a leader, start with that problem, stick with that problem, and bring this wide-ranging, diverse, uh, you know, equity-focused, uh, integrated uh, environment that allows people to be their best no matter who they are. Bring them together in an open, collaborative, uh, multidisciplined environment um, because you never know, honestly, who has the last piece to the puzzle. Mm-hmm. You know, and, but, but yet we seem to think we do know. You know, we seem we seem to think you know only white men need apply, oh, or, right, right, right. or you know like or nobody tall needs to apply, or nobody short needs to apply, or nobody with brown hair, or nobody with blonde hair, only blue eyed people, no brown eyed people. I mean, they're stupid things to say, but we do this to ourselves all the time on a regular basis. We are selecting groups to kind of work on a problem when we should be welcoming everybody to work on a problem. And we found this out in IBM. We proved it over and over again. The broader the network, the better the answer. It was never more difficult than that. And through technology, before I left, as you know, we enabled something called Innovation Jam, where we, we put That's up- like, no, I know, I- Yeah, I, yeah. We, we had 200,000, 250,000 people yeah. smacking at each other for uh, 48 hours, yeah. you know, we came up with a couple of hundred brilliant ideas that we funded 10 of, you know, with a hundred million bucks that I managed to, you know, push off to the side so <laughs> that we could do something meaningful with. So you can do this in big companies. You can do this in small companies. It's the courage of your conviction. It's the belief that you have as the leader that gets you there. Hmm. Yeah. It was amazing. I mean, the you know, some of the key things, the open, collaborative, multidisciplinary, creating a diverse environment. Yeah. Uh, unlocking value in, in, in yeah. unique ways. Yeah. And um, uh, I think that most people don't know about the unlocking the value. They don't. They don't even think about it. And look, again, I'm... I'm, by the time I'm doing all this work at IBM, I'm the executive vice president of innovation and technology. So I'm not doing any of it. But let me give you one, let's give everyone one real simple example. I mean, I was on the board of AMD. I'm not, I didn't work in AMD. I'm a director of AMD. Yeah. We did it, we did exactly the same thing at AMD. Yeah. We convinced them that they had the ability to solve a problem. For good or bad, that Intel wasn't solving. Now, if there's some Intel people on this call, I apologize. Um, and maybe you would have preferred that I didn't do this, you know, at AMD. But we convinced them that they had the wherewithal and the capability without extra money, without extra resources, without other technologies to pull off that coup that they that pulled was, off. Uh, okay, so, so Nick is very, very humble. So for those on the call, let me just make sure that you understand. Nick transformed AMD. I mean, basically, and um, solved problems that Intel. I'm, I'm repeating yourself, Nick, but this is a big, uh, it's a big deal. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. This company was being flushed down the toilet bowl. To be honest with you, that's correct. Yeah, that's yeah, right. This this company was on its way out. And again, I mean, so think about this. You're doing this from a director's seat. Yeah. I'm not running the company. I'm not twiddling bits. I'm not developing new architectures. I'm not doing any of that. I'm just finding people who are good at what they're, you know, good at what they should do and that what that we need. I'm enabling them to come to AMD and to make the difference. And by the way, to share the courage of my conviction. So it's my conviction. This is what we can do. This is how it works. You know, if you don't want to do this, don't come here. If you want to do this, come on. I'll tell you, I, I, the biggest problem I created for AMD, I probably made 5,000 millionaires in that company. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem when you got that many millionaires. 
Well, I think that's a good idea to create some millionaires. People like, <laughs> um, oh my gosh. So, uh, I I wish I could have like eighteen hours with you. I mean, because I, <laughs> I wrote tons of notes. The um, Michael, you're on the line as well. I didn't. I'm so sorry. I didn't. Uh, you had to drop or something like that. But I noticed that you used to play baseball. So I don't know if you want to introduce yourself a little bit. Or uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael DeMarco, and I had the uh, the great privilege of uh, being Nick's co-author on uh, on the book uh, that, that we'll be talking about here. And so um, uh, that's why I'm here. And and uh, a lot of the stories that are, are being told uh, I've, I've heard before and, and heard in you know slightly different ways but it's all coming out and um, as you can tell from the energy and everything it was uh, a wonderful experience to work with Nick um, to your question uh, my my baseball days are, are long behind me but um, Nick is uh, involved with a library and is where he lives in in Ridgefield and because uh, every year there's a there's a big softball tournament with some celebrities and so forth and uh he's trying to drag me out of retirement so uh so i may be i may be back someday <laughs> i can see the dragging there you go <laughs> uh, nick is good at that um so so nick what would you like to uh, thank you so much michael it's very nice to meet you and uh thank you for sharing your story although uh, i think that you will be dragged out of retirement um, if you're with Nick. So. <laughs> we need pictures. We need pictures. There you go. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I, I like that idea. So, um, so, so Nick, on um, just because we're, we're um, about an hour, or sorry, almost an hour, we have to leave some, give some people some time up to have a few questions. But so, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So can you give us some highlights of if nothing changes, nothing changes? Sure. Um, number one, the title uh, often wants to be edited by everyone. We had uh, my kids editing it. We had Mike trying to edit it. We had our editor trying to edit it. That, that title is actually from my father. Oh, so nice. He nice. gave me those words. Oh. Um, when I when I got feisty as a junior in high school, uh, and my father was a tough guy. Um, he was a guard at a criminal institution, so you can imagine how tough he was. Yeah. Um, and it's his way of telling me, son, if you're not happy with what you've been getting, then don't just keep doing what you've been doing because all you're going to get is what you've been getting. You have to change something because if nothing changes, son, nothing changes. That's kind of how the whole, actually my career, my whole life story is kind of linked to that summer night on our front porch when he gave me that lecture. Mm -hmm. So that, that book then goes on to tell my story. Mike does a great job as my writer, co-writer with me. Uh, it's autobiographical. There are 37 other people in the book. Hmm. So it doesn't just feature me. That's why it's a big book. Um, and we we give voice to 37 other people who, you know, kind of see things the way I saw things or didn't see mm -hmm. things the way I saw things. Um, and that, that I, oh, by the way, there is a book in every one of you. I will tell you right now. The question is, do you want to take the time to get it out, or do you even care to get it out? And it's it's hard. As Mike knows, it took us six years to write this book. I started and stopped several times. We got the front end of it written very quickly, and then you know it was like, does anybody care about this? You know, we, we have to make it we have to make it more profound in some way. And that's you know, as the architect of the book, I figured out what I wanted to do. And how I wanted to get it there. So uh, it's a hopefully it's an easy read, you know, for you. Um, but the whole point of the book is to in net kind of remind you that 
you're going to be judged more going forward by not what you know, but by what you do about what you don't know. Right. Okay. Good. That that is perhaps the punchline of the book. Constantly learn, never quit on yourself. Um, I mean, you'll you'll see some things in the book that I have no right to be talking about. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I mean, that's where I, if I have bona fides, I have it there. But we talk about so many other things. We talk about the banking system. Talk about the higher education system. You know, we talk about the whole issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We talk about the type of person that the world needs more of uh, going forward. So those are the things that um, kind of compelled me and kept Mike and I together, you know, writing this over 400-page uh, journal. Um, and hopefully it means something to you, you know, if you get a chance to read it. Um, I welcome your feedback. I'm always looking for things I did well and always looking for things I did poorly. So um, hopefully that gives you a quick nut sell thought process of what is really the punchline for if nothing changes, nothing changes. Wow, you uh, my my father taught me how to blow things up. <laughs> I, I did that too. He died when I was four, but uh, that was his profession, physics at Harvard. So he was heat physics. So the uh, um, but um, you know, many many important points. Constantly learn. Don't give up. Yeah, it's um, this whole it's this whole idea that everything is changing anyway. Um, you'll see in the book, there's this famous chart that I remember from the New York Times. I don't know, forty years ago. It explains. Oh, you're only twenty five. So how did you? It, it's the it's a it's the order of magnitude chart. As things get smaller, they get bigger, and as things get bigger, they get smaller. So. It's the order of magnitude chart. So we go in both directions at the same time. And that it kind of reminds me of, just, just keeps me focused on the fact that it's going to progress anyway. Because I remember where I started, you know, back in 1964. I knew where I was. And I knew what big meant and I knew what small meant. Did you mean, we, uh, did you mean 84 or 64? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're so wonderful. Yeah, you got to get better glasses too, by the way. Well, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Nick. No, no, no. I mean, so that chart kind of became my gospel, just to be candid with you. Um, you, you know, you can look at it and argue with it if you'd like, but, you know, I, I, I would encourage you to look at that orders of magnitude chart and think about where you started or mm. where you are mm. and look at where, look at where things, do you think things are big? You have no idea how big things are going to get. If you think things are small, you have no idea how small things are going to get. Um, so that's going to happen. It, it may not happen with the same fluidity as it did in the past. Maybe the time period exaggerates a little bit. Maybe we need, you know, new materials to be able to do things. But it, you know, that's out of the bottle. You're yeah. not going to shove that genie back in the bottle. No. So understand that things are going to change and therefore you should be doing all you can to figure out how do you change right along with it and how do you better understand it. Absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I dream in technology and spreadsheets, like literally. I wish I could scrape my brain, scrape the brain and put the thing on the spreadsheet. <laughs> so. Um, I agree with you 100%. Um, we're, uh, I don't want to monopolize the time, so I would like to open it up to other people's questions. Do you have any? Please unmute yourself if you have a question. Hi, I'm Simone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hi Simone, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. 
Um, as an engineer myself, and I, I know a lot of people on this call have a technical or engineering background, um, what was the inspiration for you to pivot? And that's also for um, just in general, what was the inspiration for you to pivot from, uh, what did you call it, doing honest work, I guess, uh -huh. um, as an engineer and moving more into the managerial um like what was that pivot was it um you wanted to get into it did you show other um traits that people found valuable in different parts of the business like what was that light bulb moment for you a great question simone and it's different for each of us but for me it was ibm at that time and this was in the late 60s was moving an entire mission from one facility to another. So they were moving it out of the Mid-Hudson Valley in New York. They were moving it up to Essex Junction, Vermont. And that was the work that I was doing. So I was involved in that work. And so we had to move everything, lock, stock, and barrel up to Vermont. And when you do that, there's a lot of breakage from a leadership perspective. And so they were looking around for new leaders. You know, and it was like, oh, look at this guy. You know, he can walk, talk, and chew gum. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna make him, you know, the leader of the pack. So of course it was as I said earlier, Simone, it was a mistake because that was the group I was in. That was the group that you know I was doing all the wonderful work with, you know, making these tips happen so early on. Um, and I knew all the people in the group, and you know, I, I I just continued to try to do what I was doing, and it was a mistake. Even though IBM trained me. You know, to be a be a manager, and they did that very well. Um, it didn't take hold for me. You know, I was too I was too familiar with them. I was yeah. too familiar with the work they were doing. I knew what they should have done. You know, and it's that's that's another lesson that you need to learn to figure out how to balance. And that's why I said earlier, you know, if you're going to be bad, be bad early in your career so you can <laughs> recover from it. And I was fortunate. To, you know, they they just they, it was a clear knockout punch for me, you know, and I was able to get off the mat, you know, before the count of ten. Does that help you? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Thank you. Yep. Can I ask you a question? Mm, sorry. Please. Yeah, this is Maron Mogadam. Um, so uh, Nick, uh, I enjoyed listening to you. Uh, as you said, science and technology. The, you always get to the answer if it's, you know, if it's doable, you'll do it. It's a matter of time. But the other factor that's important in all of this is the human factor. Uh, as a postdoc, I joined DuPont Corporation and I was teamed up with an associate who was an old guard. He'd been there for 22 years and he was going to teach me a thing or two. So that created some challenges. And through this, I learned a lot about how to work with others and get the job done with your hands tied behind your back because you can't do it yourself. You got to get others to do it. What do you do if they don't feel like doing it? What are your, uh, in your opinion, the top three challenges working with people in organizations? And how do you deal with that? So, Moran, thank you. Um, you sound like your background is pretty close to mine, even though we're probably in different fields. Uh, it pretty much wound out the same way. Um, so, look. I think the biggest challenge with people is to understand them, to appreciate them, and to, to know who they are, and realize what, if anything, is the opportunity to change, either to change them, Moran, or to change you and the way you're dealing with them. And I have to be totally candid. I'm 78 years old. I don't think there are a handful of people, just not even, not even a handful of people. I ever couldn't work with. Uh, there are people, and, and one of them, unfortunately, was a guy like yours who I started with. I mean, he hated my guts. I mean, he just saw me as the devil incarnate, and he didn't go to Burlington. He stayed behind, and uh, I lost track of him. But we, we were just, he figured I was out to get him. He figured I was out to take over his job, learn faster than him. Um, and I, nothing I did could help him. No, nothing I did. I mean, I tried, you know, changing the way I approach problems. You know, he was working on one chip. I was working on another. His chip was always better than mine. It wasn't. You know, I tried to help him understand that it wasn't. 
didn't matter to them. So you have to kind of eventually say to yourself, you know what, there are some of those people, you just, it doesn't work. You can't, you can't put enough energy into it. You can't put enough time and effort into it. But if you can, and you can start to see that back and forth, Mariah, where you see yourself thinking differently, like me, you know, with the crew in Bur Burlington, like, okay, I'm a jerk. I'm a lousy manager. I screwed this up for a year. I mean, how do I fix it? I stop talking. I start listening. I start enabling. I, I stop dictating. I start, I start enabling you to be your best. I mean, we went on to do great and wonderful things, that team. Just some, some of the most brilliant things that ever happened for IBM, that team did. I could have just as easily ruined it, you know, if I had insisted on being the jerk that I was. So it's a, it's a two-way street. You have to be willing to change, and you have to make your own assessment of whether or not you can change me. And if it's not worth it, Maron, then... You know, there's only a few ways to resolve conflict, you know, and you have to pick the one that says you have to leave, you know, as opposed to endure, change is the other one, uh, and, the, and the third one is leave. So those are the things that I always try to bring into balance when I'm thinking about the problems that you're talking about. You know, how do we affect meaningful change together? Let's put aside our personal differences. You know, what's the common good here? Is there a common good? You know, I mean, by the way, if you kind of drive yourself that way um, with innovation as an entrepreneur, you're always in a better spot than anyone else, to be honest with you. Don't get politically wrapped up. Don't get emotionally wrapped up. Don't get, you know, uh, spiritually. I mean, those are all important things. I don't want you to say, I don't want you to understand me to say I'm not, those are unimportant, Mariah. But if that's what you put out, if that's what you emanate, uh, then chances are you're not going to get the job done. Find the common ground. The common ground is usually, hey, I, I want to be successful too, don't I? So can you help me be successful while you're being successful? That That's usually the common ground that I look for. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so Mark, Baba, are you there? Mark, I see. Yeah, I'm here. Do you have a question? I've been missing you, Mark. Yeah, I haven't seen you for a while. I'll have to catch up sometime. No, I don't have an immediate question, but I'm enjoying the conversation. Okay, very good. I just want to make sure because Nick is uh, quite a, uh, a set of secret sauces. Um, okay, so we are a little bit beyond 3 p.m. and I, I want to... Joe, Joe has his hand up. I can see oh. Joe's hand up from here. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. Joe. Yeah, thanks, Nick. That's very informative. Thank you. Thank you Nick. Um, I go way back with IBM myself, and I've been in this field for 56 years since 67. The question would be when you look at these large organizations, for example, like IBM, that miss major points in technical history, for example, do you think that they can rebound with what they're doing with things like quantum and quantum hardware and software? Do you think there's an opportunity for them to gain? Uh, the momentum back. Thanks. Thank you, Joe, and thanks for all of your support when you were an IBM or um, Joe. Uh, I get this question a lot, um, and I'm going to try to say it without being mean spirited. IBM has never made a mistake because of the technical people in it. Uh -huh. All of IBM's mistakes are leadership mistakes. Uh, IBM's, wherever you think it is right now, it's there because people didn't have the courage of their conviction. I, I did questions like, how did IBM miss the cloud? My answer to that is IBM didn't miss the cloud. No. IBM chose to miss the cloud. It chose to miss its job. It knew exactly what it needed to do. Um, I, I don't know if you remember when Gerstler came to IBM, you know, he made this famous proclamation that I've reviewed all of the IBM strategies. We don't need another strategy. We got books of strategies. They're all right. We don't execute. We just don't execute. So, I mean, people kept trying to, you know, hang him on a petard, you know, for what he said. But he's right. He was right. And he's asked me this question too, Joe, just like you did. It's like, what happened here, Donofrio? 
And I said, well, <laughs> Lou, what, what happened here is IBM's leadership didn't have the courage of their conviction. Uh, IBM knows what to do, Joe. IBM has invented more stuff, created more value for other people. You don't want to get me started here because you know, I, I tell you, you know, the relational database, IBM, they invented that. They just let Oracle capitalize on it. Yeah, they, they, they were doing something else at the same time that they invented the relational database. So, so Joe, I, I think quantum is interesting, but don't bet your bottom dollar on quantum. I, I'm just telling you that right now. You will never have a quantum computer in your back pocket because if you do, chances are you won't be here. You'll be somewhere else. Uh, you won't be in this world. You'll be in a different world. So quantum is important to solve a certain class of problems but it's not the only answer to the, to the problem. And I'm gonna punctuate what I'm saying and stop. Next year, Joe, next year is the 60th anniversary of what at IBM? The mainframe, 60 years, 1964 to, 19, to 2024, 60 years, it's still doing what it did in 64 and more for the same people it's always been doing it for. It's transformed itself over and over and over again. There's a case, Joe, where IBM got it right and kept it right. Well, I agree with you 100%. I've worked on the 360, 370, the CMC, all of those technologies, you were right. But you're right. You hit it right on the head. Leadership. If it falters, it's going to fall all downhill. So you hit it right on the head. That's the issue. Thanks. Go, I like it. I like your point. It goes downhill. And those are the people that can blame Joe. And they shouldn't. The mm -hmm. leadership is who's accountable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Uh, so, um, to uh, to to reverberate uh, some of the points that Nick mentioned, well, I I like to mention the things that he always mentions, which is everything is known as knowable. Everyone should check out his book, uh, which is um, you know, it's going to be probably a best it's a bestseller, I think. Um. It's that it's actually done remarkably well. Thank you. Yeah. So Nick, could you tell people where they can because I looked at it online, so there's a few different places to find it. But I yeah. wrote down all Yeah, the... Amazon Amazon carries it if you prefer to go that way. There's also a little bookstore here in Richfield called uh, Books on the Common in Richfield, Connecticut. Uh they're happy to get it for you, especially if you want it personalized. Uh, you could call them, order it, and I'll go in and personalize it for you. Oh, I want um, one. <laughs> I want one. Okay. So it's up to you. Um, you know, Mike's a great partner. He's uh, he's as good an individual and a good writer friend as you could ever have. Let me honest here, and like I said, put up with me for six years. So um, tough, tough road to hoe. But there's, there's a book in each of you as well. Think about writing your own book, not just reading my book. Um, so, uh, Nick, could you, I'm looking at my notes and, um, uh, I would like to, to kind of like reverberate some of the things that you mentioned. Um, well, of course, Nick is a prodigy. I mean, I'm very, very proud to have Nick as a chairman on board. Maybe he's on the board of many other very, very large companies with or with Nick for I feel like it's, it's 30 years now. I, I did the math. And um so what one thing that he mentioned was interne entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship. So and also having courage or conviction. Also creating value and starting with the problem and unlocking the value in a unique way and trying to figure out how to create the value and also how to listen uh, and constantly learn 
and don't give up. And having a theme of equity and inclusion when you're in trouble, talk about the issues. And when you're doing, for example, R&D, as an example, you make sure that you're not trying to cram something in there or cut, cut something that's important that's in there that shouldn't be cut. So cramming other things that are... So I always think about it as what's the material impact of what you're doing, you know, when you're uh, creating something. Um, being an enabler, and listen as well as we speak, manage the risks. You know, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So, I mean, the big picture here is if nothing changes, nothing changes. I mean, Nick is the uh, profound person who knows all about that. If nothing changes, nothing changes. So, you know, if you take something away from this podcast, uh, webinar, podcast, um, you must get Nick's book. If nothing changes, nothing changes. I mean, it's something that um, that he has profound profound knowledge of. So uh, I, I want to thank you, Nick, so much for your time and Michael for your time. And uh, I would really appreciate everybody on the webinar. And I'll I'll just uh, say. Um, we are a little bit over, so uh, I don't know if there's any last comments, but uh, I just want to really, really thank you for your time and um, very grateful for that. And um, Nick. Be safe and be well and enjoy the holiday weekend, everyone. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Bye-bye. Ciao. Okay. Thank you so much. Ciao.